O Lord, uphold me, that I may uplift thee. Amen. Were David and Jonathan in a gay relationship right here in Scripture for all the world to see? How else do you explain David's grief-stricken words that your love to me, Jonathan, was wonderful, passing the love of women? This isn't the first time David and Jonathan's love seems a little deeper than platonic friendship. The soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, 1 Samuel 18 proclaims, and Jonathan loved David as his own soul. Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, 1 Samuel 19 declares, for he loved him as he loved his own life. In a heteronormative world, this expression of love between two prominent men, one of whom is Israel's most beloved king, seems about as erotic as scripture could get. But others argue that these words are merely the expression of an intense political alliance. The word used for love is the same word often used in ancient Near Eastern treaty relationships. There is no eroticism here. This argument goes just an intense political pact between the house of David and Saul's house, the dying house of Kish. Certainly there is a personal dimension here these words. It's just that all treaty relationships were based in kinship, established through familial ties, primarily emotive terms, one scholar says quite succinctly, can have politicized nuances in certain contexts. But wait, there's yet another possibility, an alternative queer reading that argues that the relationship between David and Jonathan is a decidedly heterosexual one with David performing the role of the man and Jonathan performing the role of the woman. The text indeed sexualizes the relationship, argues this scholar, but in describing Jonathan as passive and effeminate, the text is arguing in the dismissive patriarchal tones of its time that Jonathan is the equivalent of a woman and therefore unqualified for kingship by Israelite tradition. So what's actually going on here? Is this a gay relationship to be celebrated in the middle of Pride Month as evidence that one of Israel's greatest heroes, the house of David, from which Jesus came, had a same-sex relationship that was central to his life? Or is it just another political alliance like so many forged through kinship? Or is it a slander against the losing house of Kish, Saul the failed king, and his womanish son, Jonathan, smeared in the misogynistic language and culture that is all through Holy Scripture? I don't know. <laughs> Which is the good news I hope to offer to you today. Now, I know that I don't know is not often something that you hear from many pulpits. Maybe because preachers learn quickly that people come to church for answers, not more questions. They hire an expert with some training in the languages of the text and theology and rhetoric and hopefully common sense to do the scholarly work to present something that you can take home to get you through the week or help you see your lives or the world differently. The problem is that the Bible doesn't always deliver in such a transactional, consumer-driven way. The Bible never speaks with a single voice. It is a library of books, not a unified piece of literature. Texts are written in multiple contexts and historical periods, often refashioned in later contexts and later historical periods, bearing the imprint of worldviews and assumptions that may be quite different than they are today. What's more, texts often preserve a multiplicity 
of possible meanings rather than trying to reveal a single narrative, a reality that is reflected in the Hebrew language itself in its original absence of values. So one word can have multiple meanings. The Hebrew worldview, if there is such a thing, seems to differ from our own Western worldview in that it prefers multiple possibilities, even celebrates them rather than pursuing a single unified voice, a single answer to life's complicated questions. When it comes to Jonathan and David's relationship, I think that's a good thing. Because we are living through a time when sex, gender, and relationships are less static and less defined than what some of us once believed. And we have all needed to re-examine our assumptions about gender and sexual identity, paying close attention to the multiplicity of experiences within our families, our friendships, and in the wider community that have challenged so many of the binaries that most of us have inherited as part of our worldview. What's really sad to me is that so much of this re-examination is happening outside of the church, where too many congregations have accepted prudish, traditional ideas of what is acceptable even for discussion. And in so doing, we have seeded the entire discussion about what it means to be made in the image of God to the secular sphere. Let me put it another way. Our children and grandchildren have been discussing ideas, realities, and ethics around sex, gender and eroticism in the public sphere for years on their own while the church has tried to put its head in the sand. Actually, that's not entirely fair. Biblical scholars have been discussing this for years. Sex and Family in the Middle East was published in 1959. Jonathan Love David, Homosexuality in Biblical Times, was published in 1978, just to name a couple. Scholars have been writing about this stuff for decades. Either their works have been too exclusively focused on the academy, the ivory tower, or congregations have kept academics and their ideas at arm's length. At arm's length. Likely a bit of both. Either way, we have missed an important invitation from the text itself, not to receive a single sexual ethic that we can codify into our ecclesiastical law, or a definitive statement about God's plan for gender identity that we are called then to enforce, but rather to enter the conversation that is already upon us about gender, gender roles, relationships, platonic and sexual alike, the stuff of life that we are all making decisions about. And yet half the church seems to have chosen instead to reinforce a pre-1950s sexual ethic that is rooted in male attempts to control female sexuality, while the other half seems to have taken the fifth in hopes that we don't have to enter the fray. It's times like these when I remember Walter Brueggemann saying in one of my seminary classes that most Christians don't have the stomach for what's actually in the Bible. We all prefer consistent ideology and moralistic teaching, whether that teaching is conservative or progressive, to the complex narratives of Scripture that refuse to be flattened, which is a shame, since life itself is anything but ideologically pure. Moralistic teaching rarely retains its humanity, and the God we find in Scripture refuses to be pinned down. It may be too difficult at this point to believe that we can create 
that kind of space in the public domain of the church. Maybe we should just all be satisfied that at least at a church like Brown Memorial, someone struggling with their gender identity can come and discuss it in the privacy of the pastor's study without judgment or fear. Maybe it's enough for me to know that in the 17 years since I have been your pastor, I have officiated exactly one wedding out of maybe 50 or 60 where the couple didn't already live together before they were married. No reason to have to discuss that in public or its implications for a sexual ethic that actually makes sense for most people in 2021. Maybe it's good enough to know that a person can wrestle over her decision to have an abortion or come out as gay while married to a person of the opposite sex or negotiate their polyamorous relationship as a married couple all behind closed doors where the pastor is forced to think deeply and ethically on behalf of all of us. I can do that as I have for all of those situations. But I'm afraid that the biggest loser in that kind of conspiracy to keep silent is the church itself. The church's reputation becomes solidified as the place where people aren't able to bring their actual struggles, aren't able to discuss their real life ethical challenges, aren't able to live as they want to live without judgment from exclusive church communities who when they say all are welcome really just mean something more like all are welcome to come and perform one or two life roles that we have deemed as publicly discussable and therefore acceptable. An alternative would be to relax the critical judging mind that lurks in the background of so much religious life and just receive people as they are creating the space where we are all invited to engage scripture, tradition, and our own experience together without fear, really trusting that forgiveness is always available if and when we make a choice that turns out to be less than what God hopes for each of us. I saw a glimpse of the result that can happen when that kind of honesty is presented in the church yesterday in the send-off mass for Father Joe Muth at St. Matthew Roman Catholic Church. Father Joe was so clear and honest yesterday about the gospel that meets us wherever we are in our lives. He told the story of a little girl who, just completed, who had just completed her first communion a week or so ago. Father Joe shared with her that if she kept this up, there would be a spot for her with the Holy Sisters. I want to be a priest, she corrected him. Father Joe went on to ask the congregation, who is going to support this little girl in her dream to become who God is calling her to be? And don't you know there was applause, people standing on their feet as he went on to remind the church that LGBTQ Christians are no less made in the image of God, people of other faiths and no faith are no less loved and cherished by God. The church was full because people were coming to hear some truth and a preacher who isn't afraid to go up against the conspiracy of fear that the church creates whenever our role as creators of the beloved community gets confused with some kind of enforcement. What I see in this text that is most exciting to me is yet another reading, a fourth feminist interpretation that applies much of the newfound interest in female biblical characters given to us by feminist scholars to the characters of David and Jonathan. According to many scholars, the Bible portrays multiple masculinities. Scripture does not prescribe one version of masculinity. Competing biblical masculinities, Cameron Howard writes, rise and fall 
offer judgment on each other and can even coexist within the same character. According to Howard, the heteronormative masculinity at work in much of the Hebrew Bible is challenged by the descriptions of David's relationship with Jonathan. The feelings between these two men are mutual. And whether or not they were lovers, Howard writes, the tenderness of David and Jonathan's relationship contrasts starkly with their positions as warriors. David is caught between expectations of virility in battle and an affection for a man who is supposed to be his enemy. The Hebrew Bible does not clearly prefer one aspect of David's character over another, Howard argues, but instead presents both as facets of a very complex personality. A multiplicity of masculinities right here in the text. What would it look like if men in our congregation were invited to try on multiple masculinities instead of just accepting the toxic masculinity that's foisted on too many of us as teenagers and young men? And what if instead of approaching every text looking for the single answer, we came with more curiosity about how a text might be disrupting our assumptions about who we are in the world, prepared to receive uncertainty itself as a gift God gives to us to go deeper, wrestle harder, and think better together. And what if the church decided to let go of our need to perform some expected holdover role of enforcer of Victorian morality and instead decided to create a space where people of multiple identities, experiences, and backgrounds could come with all of their beauty and all of their brokenness? Confident they would be met with acceptance instead of judgment. What if? <laughs>